who was uh, five years old and uh, uh, when I met David in New York. Yeah, we were neighbors. So at that time I was uh, running Russian blog and I was taking interviews from different people. And once I saw David in, on TV in New York and I was so amazed that somebody like him <laughs> was able to get into American TV that I just wrote him an email and he replied immediately and we met next day in, uh, uh, like in downtown New York where we both lived. And and he was writing uh, 5,000 years of death at that time. So he started to send me the uh, chapter by chapter, the email. That's how I got to know it, an anthropology. Uh, and then at the same time, I was searching for, for Benjamin, for my son, uh, some kind of way uh, to educate him and myself. <laughs> and that's uh, how the framework for this project uh, was born. So the idea is to to create a, a framework for participation because I was totally horrified by the schools that Benjamin attended uh, where it's more or less was uh, instructions and discipline and memorize that and we check how well you, you remember. Uh, so Anthropology for Kids was the book that uh, supposed never end. Uh, it's only beginning of conversation that's uh, mostly done with kids and uh, that they will rewrite the answers. So it's very much in line with uh, assembly idea. Um, in, in this case, uh, David was uh, really kind of, it was so lucky that I met him because so, so actually David was uh, mostly what he was doing in his life, he was a teacher. Uh, he was first student, then he was for a short time librarian in Chicago University, and then he became a teacher for the rest of his life. And uh, he also tried to, to act the same uh, in, in his university job that was quite difficult uh, because there was a lot of this bureaucracy and horrifying things of marketing people and giving them a grade. Uh, but then Occupy uh, showed this. Uh, that it actually can work all these public lectures, some strangers with different ages coming together and, uh, and exchanging uh, ideas about really crucial questions uh, that is very important uh, for everyone. And it's more like this assembly setup is probably only a uh, framework that uh, can provide people with this um, opportunity. Uh, and then I did a bunch of books, uh, Anthropology for Kids, uh, uh, in some of them, um, uh, the, the two important ones that uh, come in parallel was the future city that uh, uh, I, based on that book, will do the workshop today. Another book about what is school, uh, and it's a book about what is nation. Uh, maybe we should go quicker. <laughs> okay. This is a bunch of people that uh, will be or already uh, in the books. And then, uh, so the What is Nation book uh, is uh, the book where, uh, where I actually did a bunch of workshops before that uh, in Iceland with Holly Kugi. Uh, and that was the first time when possible, it was possible to have 200 kids in the same time in a room, it's in a big room. And Holly, he's actually a musician, he was a band member, he knew how to control the big crowds. And that's uh, that was really, I think, enormously successful uh, because kids are also um, kind of, yeah, like they created so much content. Uh, like the uh, Reykjavik library, and then they fly us to the small towns. We had so many public exhibitions. But also I want to give an example to the kids here how we were drawing these maps. This is a city that we're going to draw today, but in Reykjavik we were, uh, we were drawing uh, the nation. Okay, in fact, the book was What is Nation? Uh, and the uh, kids were sitting around the tables and they, they were creating the nation state with their rules. And it's not always so pretty. For example, <laughs> one group of people immediately divided in girls and boys. So uh, boys told girls that in their place, they were, like the woman had no rights, and uh, like everything would be run by the man. And the girls immediately said, "Oh, okay." So they draw the red line, and they said, 
So first of all, no kids in the city, <laughs> so we're not going back to this. And then they basically started to draw against each other, like the civil war between genders. And then some other kids came to contribute to that uh, um, to that story and change the rules. Uh, yeah, so some, uh, it, it was really like, uh, I just learned a lot uh, during these workshops in Iceland. And then generally, uh, I think I learned a lot uh, during this project, not only from significant doubt, like David or Kit Hart, but also from Benjamin, my son, and from his friends, who are called genius artists and like amazing humans. So, and then, uh, maybe, oh, yeah, so that's, uh, uh, I just said that the workshops are a very important part of the uh, project because uh, it's supposed to to be like the ideal place of the book. So this is like for cities, of the different cities, that this could be, like this is one in Turkey where uh, there is no streets, people are using routes to a public space to go somewhere. Here, I don't know, some utopian cities. This is uh, by Sphere 2, created by a Chinese scientist in a uh, Chilean city. This is an interesting city that was a project of Soviet uh, physicists who, uh, who designed a city that will be in one building with a million people live there. And the whole uh, energy will be produced by the bodies of the uh, inhabitants of this um, of the space. And uh, it's a lot of egalitarian cities described in the zone of everything that you may have been read. And this is Teotihuacan. Uh, if somebody doesn't know, it's a really interesting place because it was designed and set up as a normal uh, Maya city civilization. And then uh, around 250 AD, something happens, and then citizens abandoned uh, uh, palaces, stop building pyramids, uh, shut down all the temples, and instead they engaged in this huge uh, public housing project. And they built this enormous amount of uh, kind of unbelievable uh, multi family homes. Uh, so when archaeologists discovered, discovered that, uh, they were thinking that this is actually the palace, it's not a normal uh, uh, living space because they are so beautiful, they have rest, and they have uh, a lot of public space. Um, yeah, so it exists for many years, it was very complex, multicultural, uh, they have a neighborhood uh, devoted to the all inhabited by the different uh, nationalities. So it was basically like a New York or Paris at that time. Uh, but yeah, and yeah, this is uh, this is our map uh, for today. So as you can see, it's only the beginning of uh, uh, the place where we can build build in uh, joy and uh, right. And so ideally, I would be very interested in very practical questions of uh, how we can build the city together. Uh, for example, how school will be arranged, uh, what to do with foreigners, uh, would, be, would be their police or prisons, uh, would be their banks, uh, do we need money, how we produce uh, energy, and so on and so forth. And now I want to introduce to Nicholas here, who was uh, also accredited, he met him in Occupy London, and also right. Jamie is a very big specialist in assemblies, and hopefully will help us to run the Yes, we're pleasure. Hi, mums and dads, and hello, young people. Hello. Okay, very good. So, you're going to be building your own cities, designing your own cities. Okay, so I'm not going to talk for long, and then you can get on and do great stuff. I'm just looking at this and listening to Nika's uh, chat, and I, I'm, uh, I was in the streets a lot with Occupy, and it was the maddest thing, you know. Um, we were in London, and that, that, there was about a thousand people living in tents outside St Paul's Cathedral in the, in the winter. And there was no leaders. I just saw a picture here that you had, I don't know if you remember it, but one, I forgot all about this, right? Um, this is not a protest, this is a process. And it's really interesting because we, nobody, we all had to make our own minds up together, you know, participatory democracy. 
you know, and David Graeber was a really big part of that, right? And it was super cool. And I'll, I'll just tell you two things, because that just go on forever. But there's two things I think are really cool. One, imagine being Jimmy. So he's a rough sleeper. So as a homeless person, you'll find on your map, young people, it asks you where there's no homeless people in this city. So it shows you places where homeless people can live. But in, in Occupy London, Jimmy was living on the steps of St Paul's Cathedral and he woke up one day and there was 4,000 of us, right? And he'd been living there for seven years. And he was going, Cap, this is where I live, go, go away. <laughs> and, uh, but he stayed, you know, because he lived there, right? And, you know, we built a kitchen, we had Tent City University, we had amazing people come and talk there. David came and spoke there. And Jimmy went straight to the kitchen, okay? And he lived in the kitchen and he said amazing things. He said, you know, you lot, when you came first up, I was so furious, but I'm a rough sleeper and I beg. And no one even looks at me ever. I'm invisible on the streets. And yet you lot, you look at me and you listen to me and you even hold me and dance with me. And he said, it's, it's not what I'm used to. And there was a lot of people who came along who were living on the streets who had serious mental health issues. And all of them said the same thing. You know, you will hold us and, and listen to us and take us seriously. And they would take the mic, like everybody, and they'd see, you know, Jimmy, we, he was chopping carrots. And he said, I think what we should do is this. We were having problems with the police. I think what we should do, we said, go to the assembly. You've got to take the mic and give your idea. And he went down there gave his idea, and there was this forest of hands. And he said to us afterwards, you know, before you, I was just a rough sleeper and an alcoholic, but I'm a dad, and I'm a welder, and I'm a fullback. And he listed all these things about his life, he was proud of that he'd forgotten. And he said, and I'm an occupier. And for us, this was a big deal. There was no highly educated political people running it. It was Jimmy, okay? And then the second thing is this, um, we had, we had a woman who had six children, spent half her life in hostels, and when she would take the mic, she said the thing that really mattered. When people take the mic and they're confident, and, well, this is my opinion, blah, 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 okay? You know, there'd be some hands up there. But when she took the mic, she would go, I'm dead nervous. I've never done anything like this before. But I just, I've just got to say this. And when Tammy spoke, there was just a forest of hands, and it's because we were learning type of political language that was visceral. She was speaking from the gut. You didn't have to have a degree to understand what she was talking about. That's really what lifted us up with this participatory democracy in Occupy. I'm not going to talk for much longer because I think we should start to, should we start designing cities with the kids? Is that a good idea? Yeah, let's do it. So, so um, what's going to happen is, let's, let's let young people really go for it, but also please everyone get involved in it. They're literally designing a city. Okay, and so as Nika said, there's all kinds of great ideas that have come out of this project of revenue. It's totally free, so please like to encourage the young people. Point out stuff you think is brilliant, and, and please do get involved in it as well. Yeah, so everybody can go.